This is part two of the history of the Great Lakes vessel. This time we're going to be doing the steam age to the modern era. The first steam engine was invented by Thomas Newcomen in 1712. However, steamships wouldn't make their way on the Great Lakes until the 1800s. These steamships still had sails, but after a while they disappeared because the engines became more efficient. In 1835, the screw propeller was copyrighted by two engineers, one from England named Francis Smith and one from Sweden named John Ericsson. The screw propeller proved to be popular because of the many advantages it had over side wheels. In the 1840s and 50s, coal mining became more popular and it began replacing wood as fuel for the steam engine. In the 1860s, more and more railroads were being built around the country so, the number of passengers for the passenger lines dwindled. So, ship owners decided to convert their vessels into cargo ships. But because of limited hold space and a lack of deck hatches, most of them were used as package freighters. After the shift in usage of the freighters, the first ore dock was built in Marquette, Michigan in 1859. Ten years later, a veteran shipbuilder named Elihu Peck designed a ship that was meant to carry iron ore in bulk. The ship was named R.J. Hackett and had two structures, one in the bow and one in the stern, and left the deck open so it could be loaded with cargo. But what happened to all the sailing vessels? Well, ship owners decided to use them as barges. They were pulled by small steam-powered tugboats. In the 1830s, exploitation of America's Midwestern woodlands became available. Because of this, lumber hookers were built and carried wood around the Great Lakes. In the 1870s, the lumber industry exploded as many Americans were moving west and needed wood to build their homes. But later in the 1920s, seemingly endless supply of the pine that was in Michigan and Wisconsin was all gone, and the industry shifted to the Pacific Northwest. So, many of the lumber hookers were just ba abandoned or burned because their small sizes made them useless for anything else. In the 1880s, the whaleback freighter was invented by Captain Alexander McDougall. Whaleback freighters were built with a cylindrical hull so that waves could pass over them easier. But this caused cargo to shift in the holds, which made walking and working on the deck much more difficult and caused seasickness. Because unloading a ship was very hard, the first grain elevator was built in 1843 by Joseph Dart and was steam-powered. Then later, in 1880, Alexander Brown engineered a tower with a bridge that it would extend over docked ships and use cables and buckets to move the bulk cargo from the hull of the ship to the shore. These unloaders were named the Hullet Unloading Machine. The first ship to take full advantage of the Hullet Unloading Machine was the Augustus B. Wolven. The ship featured sloped sides, which made it easier for the Hullet Unloading Machine to pick up cargo. Following the Wolven, many ships were built like it. In 1902, Towner Webster designed a conveyor system for a vessel which made it easier to unload. So the self-unloading system was now invented. In 1914, war broke out in Europe. And as the U.S. prepared for a possible intervention, the demand for steel and grain exploded. In 1917, as the U.S. joined the war, an emergency fleet company was established and was used to build many ocean-going freighters for the war effort. By the end of the war, Approximately 300 ocean-going freighters were built, and the emergency fleet consisted of more than 1,000 ships. When the Second World War broke out, another emergency shipbuilding program was established to support the countries fighting against Nazi Germany. When the U.S. joined the war in 1941, the shipyards turned their attention to building many bulk carriers which would carry the necessary materials for supporting the U.S. in the war. In 1948, a new ship was ordered, but this ship was to be no ordinary vessel. It would have an enclosed superstructure in the stern, which the sides would reach all the way to the hull. 
And on top of that, it would have an additional superstructure. It would also feature a tapered and shortened smokestack. And would have a unique paint scheme. After it was built, many shipping companies used the design on their own vessels. As the 1950s rolled around, taconite pellets became a popular choice on the Great Lakes. And to support the shipment of the taconite, many vessels were built in the 1950s, so the shipyard yards were at full capacity. And because of that, shipping companies looked to alternative ways to build vessels. So they decided to convert ocean-going vessels into Great Lakes bulk carriers. In the 1960s, shipping companies started to take example from ocean-going freighters and would build their ships with one superstructure located in the aft. By the 1980s, all ships built in the Great Lakes had their superstructure in the back. In 1972, the first thousand-foot freighter was built in the Great Lakes and named the Stuart J. Court. The vessel would be very maneuverable, featuring eight bow thrusters. After the Stuart J. Court, 12 other 1,000-footers were built in the Great Lakes, the last of them being the Polar Jugurtha. In the 1970s, river-class vessels were built because of the dwindling amount of small vessels that could carry iron ore to the steel mills up the Cuyahoga River. By the time the 2000s rolled around, no ships had been built in the Great Lakes. And in the 2010s, shipping companies looked to other countries to build their ships for them. The most popular choice being China. Thus, the vessels of the Equinox class and the Trillium class were built. In 2021, we saw the arrival of the Captain Henry Jackman, the Equinox 3.0. And to be completed in 2022, the Mark W. Barker is being built for the Interlake Steamship Company. It also just received its bow section. Anyways, thanks for watching and subscribe. Bye.